Well, do you want to talk about the patent report? Well, I, so I did read that report, and um, I also read, I think, that I don't know if you saw the Manda Weiss piece. They really uh, uh, point out a number of serious flaws with the report. I think the most egregious of which is actually that in early January, there was a UN uh, investigation that was uh, uh, that, that intended to investigate uh, the crimes committed on October 7th and since. Um, it was basically a more comprehensive investigation, right? It was what led up to October 7th, what happened on October 7th, uh, and what has happened since October 7th. Obviously, Israel didn't want that investigation to take place. And so the Israeli health ministry, um, they instructed, they ordered doctors not to cooperate with those, uh, with those investigators because they were obviously going to determine all kinds of things that Israel did not want to get become public. Instead, what they did was they said, no, we will not cooperate with the investigation that is supposed to take a more comprehensive look at everything, one, and also, two, that actually has investigative power that actually is supposed to prefer evidence. And that's a, a different word that is used. Uh, then the, the patent report, she is not pursuing an investigation that is supposed to um, determine evidence, certainly nothing of legal um, validity. Instead, um, this this report is basically just to gather information um, because her she, she is basically the you know the 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 head of special representative on sexual violence and conflict. So she's not an investig investigatory body. She is not um, uh, going to be looking for evidence. She's just basically um, collecting information. And again, these are legal terms, but there's information and there's evidence and there's different standards by which evidence is evidence and, and information is information. Um, and in fact, they even describe what these standards are. So there's basically like, there's at least three standards that they, they, they describe in this report. There's reasonable grounds to believe. That's one level of evidence. And that is the main conclusion that there's quote, reason, uh, reasonable uh, grounds to believe that sexual violence uh, uh, was committed on October 7th. Um, and we're, we should get back to that because even that argument um, has some flaws to it. But basically, they did not argue in this report that there was clear and convincing evidence to believe that there was sexual violence committed on October 7th. And they definitely did not believe that there was, quote, beyond a reasonable doubt that there was sexual violence committed on October 7th. They did conclude that there was clear and convincing evidence that sexual violence was committed to, uh, the, de to, to the hostages, but not on October 7th. Um, so anyways, again, it's just important to lay that all out. Um, because when we're talking about evidence and making arguments for, for, especially for legal reasons, there are different standards and different definitions. And it's important to uh, emphasize that what we're talking about is basically one of the lowest standards uh, of evidence that is required to make this case. Yeah, it's also interesting, um, as the Mondo Weiss article points out, they did not um, attribute any act of sexual violence to Hamas or other Palestinian resistance groups in particular. And so she said, um, Patton said during a press conference, given the multiple actors, it was Hamas, it was Palestinian Islamic Jihad, there were other armed groups, there were civilians, armed and unarmed. I did not go into attribution given the time and given the fact that I was not conducting an investigation. This is this is a great point. And I think the other the the, the corollary problem is that she doesn't really cite sources. She basically just says, trust me. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, the problem, I mean, normally I would say, okay, fine, we'll trust you. But, but the problem here is that your sources were curated by the Israeli government. And she lists out the people she spoke with, the IDF, the Shin Bet, Israeli ministries, the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog, who said that there's no innocent in Gaza, the wife of the Israeli president, um, and one or two other Israeli national institutions like the Forensic Evidence uh, um, uh, you know, Institute and one, one, maybe one other, but all Israeli institutions, which are, you know, 95% of Jewish Israel Israelis um, either believe Israel is committing uh, the right, uh, using the right um, appropriate amount of force in Gaza or not enough force. So the, the people you're talking to um, are all incentivized owing to their own biases and their own trauma and, and their own family members that, that they've lost and friends that they've lost, they're all going to tell you what the narrative in Israel, which is basically that um, 
you know, the, the, these uh, people committed sexual violence. Um, and in fact, there's even there's even more egregious things that that the Mando Weiss point, po points out here, which is that um, they basically inflate the assessment of how many locations this sexual violence apparently uh, happened at. It's a very interesting point that they make. But basically, they there's 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 the Nova Music Festival, um, there's Route Two Three Two, and then there's one kibbutz. The report claims that sexual violence took place in multiple locations. And this is part of the narrative that this was right, widespread and systematic, right? The more locations there were, the stronger the case it is to be made that this was systematic. But in fact, what the Mando Weiss report here shows, and um, it, it, um, um, they, they basically say that that was an inflated, that, that, that was an inflated assessment because actually Route 232 and the Nova Music Festival were the same location. Route 232, and, and because they're used interchangeably, you're basically talking about the same location. And so they're basic. And so here, here again, we're talking about trying to get at, because you're asking us to trust you, right? Remember, you're not citing sources, you're just saying trust us, but then you're intentionally inflating the number of locations to make it seem like it was more systematic than it was, even though the conclusion was it wasn't systematic because it was only three locations. In fact, it was only two locations. And in fact, even those two locations, um, we don't have forensic evidence. We don't have uh, um, uh, we don't have any uh, uh, victims. Um, and in fact, there was based, according to uh, um, according to the report, there was only one new wit. There was only one new testimony um, in addition to the uh, previous testimony. So it's basically a, a washed up um, kind of regurgitation of everything we already knew um, uh, in UN clothing to give it more legitimacy. Um, but but basically, there's all, not a whole lot new here. And it's interesting how the media used it to show that all the, the stories, all the atrocity propaganda from October 7th was true. When actually, if you actually read it, that's not what was revealed at all. The, the thing that to me is just so insidious is that, like, wasn't there not enough, weren't there enough people I killed know, on October right. 7th? Like, wasn't- Well, we know this, the Gray Zone published this really interesting piece. Uh, they got their hands on, someone handed over here, let me see if I can get it up right now. The Hasbara piece? Yeah. Of like, Frank was it? Luntz. Frank Luntz. Yeah. Oh, good old so Frank Luntz. This lobby, this famous like pollster lobbyist, Frank Luntz. I just wanted to mention too, Zach, I don't know if you would agree with this, but I personally see some connections between that sort of narrative and wanting that, you know, sexual assault narrative. Similarly to in the United States, the demonization of like black men. Like it would, that would be a favorite depiction of being these savage, sexually assaulting, you know, uh, just it's not the first time this has been used to demonize a population. Brad, in fact, I tweeted this out a few weeks back, but between the end of the Civil War in the United States in 1945, I believe, some, uh, yeah, roughly 1945, the number one reason that was provided uh, by white people who lynched black people was that they had raped, that had committed rape. That was the number one reason. It wasn't that they ki killed anyone. It wasn't that they, you know, um, stole anything. Uh, they didn't. It was no. It, they they raped women. They raped white women. Yeah, it was right. black men raping white women. That was what riled people up. That is what got people to justify the violence. Yeah. And I think what you, the the Katie the graphic that I think I, I I saw that graphic as well, which is that. If you look at the um, these pollsters like Frank Luntz, who are doing all this, you know, research uh, with audiences, and they're trying to understand what what the, what resonates with them, what is it that really gets ticks, gets people to say, you know what, fuck it, kill them all? It's it, it's accusations of rape. Yep. So here it is. Okay, here we go. Uh, reading this really important gray zone piece. Uh, let me just set it up before I zoom in on that. Leaked Israel lobby presentation urges U.S. officials to justify war in Gaza with, quote, Hamas rape, end quote, claims. This is from March 6th. So they got their hands on a presentation. The gray zone has obtained slides from a confidential Israel lobby presentation based on data from Republican pollster Frank Luntz. They contain talking points for politicians and public figures seeking to justify Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip. And so one of the things that they saw, some of the evidence, they polled people on what um, bothered them the most. 
So which bothers you more, that Hamas? And then you could to choose your two top choices. And the thing that bothered the most at 31% was raped civilians. So which bothers you more, that Hamas raped civilians, massacred civilians? Those are the top two. Right. And so there's a reason that that is such a focus of so much of what um, Israel defenders are doing, because they either knowingly are high up who have been told what the talking points are, or what other what also happens is that they just say that, and then other people who are not in bad faith just hear that more than other things, and they regurgitate it. Or we know that it obviously has an impact, so they hear that, and it has an impact, and it's that much stronger of an impact, so it's like a cycle. For me, it was obvious from the beginning, because the, the, the atrocities that were committed, the number of people killed was known already within a day or two, right? And basically that only lasted, is that only gave Israel so much license, so much time to kill so many Palestinians. And what Israel realized was as the more time that passed, the more and more people got more and more horrified at what Israel was doing in response. Right. And so it needed a new justification. It had to come up with right. some new reason to kill Palestinians and to bring the world on board with it. And what was that reason? It, it was the rape allegations. So disgusting. And it's so important the way you and Brad just brought up the history of weaponizing rape to justify lynching or genocide or just murdering people. Um, so they can feel that what is actually murder, they can feel as some kind of righteous revenge, protecting the honor and innocence of their women. Frank Luntz also found that um, the most potent weapon against Israel, there are two. The second most potent weapon against Israel is um, Israel's attacking Israel. So when Israelis attack Israel, that's a very potent weapon that I guess has an impact on people. They become more critical of Israel. And the, the, but that's the second most potent. The most potent is the visual destruction of Gaza and the human toil. And they point out in this little handy slide it looks like a genocide, even though the damage has nothing to do with the definition. In other words, they're showing an image that looks disturbing, although it may have nothing to do with genocide. Which is, I guess, maybe what we're supposed to say. <laughs> Wait, so he's giving us tips and tricks here? Is that what this is? <laughs> yeah. Um, the visual d destruction of Gaza. I mean, he he's right. When you see, when you see these aerial uh, 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 shots, the drone footage of entire not neighborhoods but towns and cities just completely leveled to the ground um i think i think what you realize is that oh uh, this is obviously there's no attempt here to target anything uh, you know military targets right i think that i think those those images just m make the argument that israel's going after hamas totally absurd is that no israel is destroying every single building in gaza which I think is why, as this goes on longer and longer, and the, it becomes clearer that the ratio of um, Hamas officials to civilians is extremely low. I think that there are some people who, after October 7th, they were very ex um, tolerant of what Israel was doing. And I think it's becoming clearer, even to those people, even to people who were at first... Israel has the right to defend itself. It's becoming so clear that this is not a question of self-defense. That's exactly right. And this is, uh, this is weird. Frank Luntz was asked to comment. The gray zone asked him for a comment, and he responded, this is not helpful. This is not helpful. Yeah, all caps for not. Which is very weird. Did, did he, as if like the gray zone is trying to help him. It's just a bizarre thing to say. Such a weird yeah, guy. I don't even get what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that the gray zone isn't helping Israel spread yeah, the, like, the propaganda. Oh no, the, the gray, now that they know that, they're not going to publish this story. Yeah. Um, Frank Luntz is a weird guy. Yeah, you gotta you gotta wonder what motivates a person to pull an audience of people and try and figure out what word, what phrase, what accusation gets them to be okay with the genocide. Right, because he wants them to be okay with it. Well, here's another hint as to where his loyalties lie. Well, he, he's 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 part of the Washington Blob. I mean, he's he's been a consultant for APAC and for the Israel Project and for every you know pro-Israel advocacy group in Washington for decades. I mean, that, that's he he's made a career out of that.
And here's how he spent Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving with Israel's finest. I was blessed to be invited to join 60 of the most heroic people I've ever met. I bought them dinner, and they taught me the meaning of selfless service. Yeah. Bad, bad toupee, Frank. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, you're in Israel. You might as well shave your head. It's like the national haircut. <laughs> no, I think I remember him when he was bald, actually. Terrible. Poor guy. I, I would just say, though, to be fair, Katie, celebrating Thanksgiving with a bunch of genociding colonizers right. it's is very on brand. Yeah. yeah. The way to commemorate it. Yeah. It's a good point, Brad. Yeah. He's making yeah. that colonial connection. Yeah. Thankful well, for the, we did have We did have that general saying that um, biological warfare wouldn't be bad. Remember? There's a general who said that biological warfare could be. Had its strengths, like giving oh, them diseases, diseases. Yeah. Well, I think there was there was some reporting on diseases spreading among Israeli soldiers in Gaza. Yeah, there was. Yeah. And <laughs> and then Israel was like, "Oh wow, we better figure out a solution to this humanitarian crisis because it's affecting us too." Um, I mean, this is kind of reminiscent now of COVID, which is that um, biological weapons, germs, diseases don't care whether you're Israeli or Palestinian. Um, and so whatever whatever horrible diseases are spreading in Gaza, they will eventually spread into Israel. Um, so it's, you know, you have to wonder what these people are even thinking. Um, why would they want that to, to wish that on themselves, which is what will, will inevitably happen. With something, what, uh, okay, Gloria Eland, my, I, I just Googled this and this is how I found it. Because I remember we interviewed um, Gideon Levy, the Israeli journalist at Haaretz, and I remember he described it as Nazi proposals. And here's what he was, here's his article. Monstrous Gaza proposal is evil in plain sight. Kiora Eland is one of the thinking officers to have come out of the IDF, pleasant and eloquent, his demeanor uh, is all modernization, all moderation and sound judgment. I'm gonna have to look this up. Yeah, but by the way, this <clears throat> this guy, Kiora Elad, Eland, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name actually. Um uh, I believe it's a he, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, he um he he, he uh, has a long history of uh, proposing um of, of coming up with these plans to uh, depopulate Gaza. For, for 20 years now, he's had all these pipe dreams. I think the first one was first proposed in maybe in the early 2000s, kind of in the wake of the failure at Camp David and Taba. There were these half-baked ideas, and I believe he was the one that proposed them, to basically figure out a way of convincing Egypt to carve out North Sinai um, and give it and give North Sinai to the Palestinians. Um, and then and, and then basically that would be the Palestinian state. It would be this kind of um, you know, you you push all the Palestinians from Gaza to North Sinai, and then the refugees can all go to North Sinai, and and the Palestinian state will be based in Sinai. Um, and that was his idea, and, he, and it resurfaced again, and I believe, uh, to, uh, you know, in, in, in the subsequent two decades, the idea resurfaced multiple times, and he was oftentimes the one behind it. Um, and then, of course, he, he was, you know, and then similar ideas have, have, have emerged since October 7th. Um, when the Israeli military came up with a plan, again, to try and expel Palestinians from Gaza to Sinai. And here we are, uh, uh, um, kind of, uh, uh, sort of, all eyes are on Rafah now, and, and we'll see what happens. But um, that's been the plan for, for 25 years, according to this guy. Well, I, fa- I found and I found this, what I was looking for. Um, here we go. Former Israel general says severe epidemics in Gaza would help Israel win the war. A retired senior Israeli general has said that Israel should not shy away from permitting the outbreak of severe epidemics amongst Palestinians in southern Gaza as it will bring Israel closer to victory. And that quotes him saying, the international community warns us of a humanitarian disaster in Gaza and of severe epidemics. We must not shy away from this, as difficult as this may be. After all, severe epidemics in the south of Gaza Strip will bring victory closer and reduce casualties among IDF soldiers. Unreal. I mean, it's, it's, it's one among 
hundreds, not, not dozens, but hundreds, potentially thousands of statements made by senior Israeli political and military officials calling for genocide in Gaza. I mean, this is par for the course. It's, he's innovative in his methodology. Yeah. But in terms of his end goal, no different than uh, things said by Netanyahu and Golant and Herzog and everybody else. Absolutely disgusting. Well, Zach, thank you so much. Are you working on anything new now? I know you're always working on stuff. You must be exhausted from I pr- having to I, read that terrible piece. I, the report wasn't it wasn't terrible. Um, no, I mean the, that article, the Newsweek article. Oh, the Newsweek article. No, I love that stuff. Uh, that stuff um, boils my blood. So I like my bu- blood boiling. Um, no, I've got a course coming out. Maybe oh, I can I, yeah. I can plug the course.